Though valence shell electron pair repulsion theory has some good qualities, like for example, we can figure out that oxygen molecules have two bonds that hold them together, or that nitrogen molecules have three bonds that hold them together. The theory is a little bit limited in that it cannot predict certain qualities of molecules. For example, oxygen responds to magnetic fields. It's called a paramagnetic molecule. Nitrogen, on the other hand, when you pour that sucker through a magnetic field, it does not respond. It's called diamagnetic. Vesper's theory also fails to account for structures of molecules that are called electron deficient. What I mean by that is if you have a molecule like B2H6, diborane, that dude only has 12 valence electrons. Which makes it impossible to connect all of these atoms. If you wanted to draw a Lewis structure, for this molecule, like this one, you would really need to have way more electrons than you actually have available. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. So we needed to have a new theory. We needed another way of describing what goes on in molecules. In molecular orbital theory, electrons exist in places called molecular orbitals. These are very similar to our atomic orbitals from quantum theory. For example, if you had a molecule that was just the simplest that you can get, let's say hydrogen. Each hydrogen has one electron in the 1s orbital. And these orbitals are described by something that's called a wave function. The wave function for the 1s orbital looks like a sphere. You could call that guy the 1s. And when that wave function has a positive interaction with another wave function from another hydrogen atom, you could say that their probability space uh, has a constructive interference with the wave. If the waves are not in phase with one another, they can have a destructive interference. Where the wave looks more like this, with a node. The positive interactions end up with a combined molecular orbital that looks kind of like an oval, and one that looks like two separated and opposite spaces. The first one, the positive interaction, is called a bonding orbital. And it's lower energy than its counterpart, the antibonding orbital. To visualize how electrons fill these orbitals, we can draw a diagram that shows the two different orbitals from each of our hydrogen atoms combining to create a, a lower energy orbital that we will call a, a sigma 1s. The sigma stands for uh, a molecular orbital. It's a new Greek symbol for this. Uh, and that orbital is called a bonding orbital. The antibonding orbital, which has a higher energy, has a similar symbol, but it's given a star. So this would be called the sigma star 1s. To fill in the basically an off-bow diagram, but for molecules, all you need to do is figure out how many valence electrons each atom is donating to this bonding. Hydrogen has one, 
from each. So I will draw one, two arrows. I fill in the molecular orbitals exactly the way I would fill in an off-bow diagram by putting my arrows in the lowest orbital first and then pairing them up after I make sure that each orbital only has one upspin electron. To write the electron configurations of slightly more complicated molecules, like nitrogen for example, we can start by thinking about their atomic electron configurations. Nitrogen is 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. We can see that nitrogen's valence electrons exist in two different kinds of orbitals, the 2s and the 2p. We can guess how the 2s orbitals are going to interact for two different nitrogen atoms. You can say, well, they'll probably behave exactly like the hydrogen ones, forming a bonding 2s orbital and an anti-bonding 2s orbital. But how exactly do the p orbitals interact? Well, you can think of them as being in three different directions. One of those directions has the p orbitals having a direct collision, an overlap. In that case, those direct hit bonds will still behave like a sigma bond. They will have a direct hit, direct overlap, just like the spheres from the 1s orbitals or the 2s orbitals. However, the p orbitals that are in the other two directions, the one up and down and the one into and out of the board, those interactions are a little less direct. We call those interactions pi bonds. There's two different pi interactions that can happen and one sigma for the p orbitals. So to make the diagram for nitrogen, what you really need to do is include not only how the s orbitals would interact, but also the two different kinds of p orbital interaction. Now the question becomes, well, what order do you put those in? What energies are those available at from our two Ps that are from the two different nitrogens? Well, experimentally, using PES data, we can find out for most of the elements in the second period that the lowest energy interactions are actually the pi bonds. So we could have our pi bonds from our 2p. The next level energy will be our sigma bond from that direct hit. Above that are the antibonding orbitals for those pi's. And on top of that, the antibonding orbital for the sigma. Now, how we fill up the electron configuration has to do with how many valence electron each nitrogen can have available. We know that nitrogen has five valence electrons from its electron configuration, so we can fill up our electrons one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And this is really kind of perfect. At first, it's kind of hard to see the, the beauty of MO theory. But if you look really carefully, you have, you have a bonding orbital and an antibonding orbital to cancel each other out. And then one, two, three filled bonding orbitals. This matches exactly with our Lewis structure of nitrogen having three bonds. Our diagram also shows us that all of our electrons are paired up, which helps us see how nitrogen 
is a diamagnetic material that will not respond to a magnetic field. According to photoelectron spectroscopy data, oxygen and fluorine behave a little bit differently than nitrogen and the other elements in the 2p area. The beginning starts the same with our 2s orbitals combining to form our bonding 2s orbital and our anti-bonding 2s orbital. That stays the same. However, when scientists do the spectra for the P's, something weird kind of happens. The sigma bond is actually a lower energy for oxygen and fluorine. And the pi bonds are a little bit higher. This one's actually pretty easy to remember because it's rather symmetrical. Now to fill in the molecular electron configuration for oxygen, we need to consider how many valence electrons oxygen has. Each oxygen has six valence electrons for a total of 12 valence electrons available for bonding. So let's fill in the molecular orbitals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Now this is pretty interesting. You can see how in our top orbitals, we have these two electrons that are not paired up. That accounts for the paramagnetic quality of the oxygen molecule, how oxygen is attracted to a magnetic field and something like nitrogen is not. Oxygen's bond count can also be predicted by looking at the orbitals we have our bonding and our antibonding, and those two guys cancel out. Then we have one, two, three filled, but then these two electrons here, acting as like one negative bonding orbital, canceling out one of these dudes, making it have two, a bond order of two. Technically speaking, the proper way to calculate a bond order, which will tell you how many bonds are in a molecule, is to take half of the number of electrons in bonding orbitals and subtract the number of electrons in antibonding orbitals. And that number should tell you how many bonds you have. For oxygen, we know it's two from valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. But in MO theory, we know that we have, let's see, how many bonding? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons there. And how many non bondings? One, two, three, four. What's 8 minus 4? Four? 4. What's 4 divided by 2? Two? 2 for our bond order. So MO theory not only predicts how many bonds this molecule should have, but it also predicts the fact that oxygen is paramagnetic. To wrap it up, we need molecular orbital theory to predict weird properties of atoms like whether or not they respond to a magnetic field, whether they're paramagnetic, or diamagnetic, which we can tell if they have a single electron that's not paired in some kind of molecular orbital, or if they, all the electrons are paired in their molecular orbitals. 
we can also justify this new thing called bond order. which tells us how many bonds are in a molecule. We can create these molecular orbitals from taking our atomic orbitals and combining them together. Lower energy orbitals, where it's easier for electrons to exist in positive interactions of the wave function, are called bonding orbitals and ones where there's a, a destructive interference are called antibonding orbitals, places where it's harder for the electron to exist. We fill up these molecular orbitals exactly the way we would in an off-ball diagram for atoms. And that's really all you need to know about molecular orbital theory.